My name is Blair Beavers, also known as Gem Geek on Pearl Guide. These are Jeremy's pearls, metallics. All right, so what's covered? I'm probably going to skip around here, but um, we're going to talk about Nacre. And I'm just going to get right to it because I have a lot of slides. I'm going to move really fast. All right, so whenever I talk about pearls, the first thing I say is forget about the grain of sand. Nacre is a miracle of nature and it's, it's directed by genetics, but basically it assembles itself and it's fabulous stuff. Um, material scientists are fab fascinated with it. They're trying to mimic nacre with materials for constructing things. So airline bodies may be lighter and harder because of mimicking nacre. They make ceramic by making nacre sized platelets and arranging them and it's something like 2,000 times tougher to impact than regular ceramics. And, uh, and the interesting thing about uh, this one about the glass is they found when they looked at nacre more closely that the platelets when they align it's not like what well, you see pictures where it's a perfect hexagonal line but when you look at it very very closely it's actually wavy and they engraved this wavy pattern like nacre on the surface of glass and the glass was 200 times stronger just by laser engraving a pattern that mimicked nacre so there's a lot of potential with nacre. Okay, so this next one, um, Douglas talked about pearl fish. This next one is from a G&G &G article, um, a most unusual blister pearl, and you can see that a pearl fish became trapped and the oyster couldn't dislodge it, and it became entombed there, and you can see it in the x-ray, and there's a little picture of a pearl fish. But Basically, the thing is, and I love standing at GIA and telling them, is it doesn't matter whether it, it's there or not. It, the cells are programmed to make nacre, and that's what they do until they reach the end of their programming to make nacre. And it's not necessarily a reaction to an irritant. We don't really know for sure that that doesn't play a part, but it would do it anyway. So you could make, instead of putting a Mabe implant, you could put a pearl fish and you're still gonna get that same thing. And I have to tell you that I am, I am a total freak about Nacre. I'm not, promise not to put you to sleep and tell you everything I'd love to tell you about Nacre. But um, I read a lot of scientific articles and I send emails back and forth with scientists and educators about this. And we geek out about something nobody else really wants to talk about. <laughs> And my friends are very nice to me. They'll listen for a few minutes, but then that glazed over look sets in and I, I know to back off. But basically bivalve nacre has a smooth, it's, it, it's got a smooth surface, it's got a terraced pattern. And if you look at the top part of the illustration, the outside is the peri, actually periostracum and it's made of laths and it's, and it's called um, prismatic nacre because it's made of vertical prisms. See, now that's nacre trivia. You guys are going to be great at this at parties. <laughs> okay. And then you have a little hexagonal um, crystals. And so to the right of that, there's an illustration. And so you have interlaminar membranes between those crystals. And you have a surface membrane that is over the nacre to protect it as it grows. And the animal just, you know, is rubbing constantly against the membrane. So you need something to protect it. And underneath that, you have this nutrient-rich liquid. And when the, in, in, when the intensity or the concentration of the nutrients get to a high enough point, it automatically crystallizes and then forms the shape. Okay, so there's a terrace nacre and bivalves. Looks like this. You can see that it's like growing in rows. And I have a thing for electron microscope photographs. Wow. But um, this one shows, if you've ever looked under a microscope at a pearl, you get a swirly pattern. And it doesn't matter if it's round or if it's on the surface of the nacre. It could be perfectly flat. But it still wants to make this pattern. And it's driven by screw locations and things that if uh, you don't want to hear about, probably, but are fascinating because nature shows these patterns on a regular basis in all kinds of uh, growths. So if you look at this slide, the top two show 
terraced nager and you can see kind of like oh they're coming up and they're joining together and then when you look at the lower ones you can see as you back away you can see that you can see that they're forming the little crystals at the at the fronts the nager fronts but they're already starting to form the patterns a fascinating to me <laughs> okay so we talked about bivalve nacre. Gastropod nacre, or what we think of as snails, is grows in towers, and it doesn't have the interlamellar membranes don't go all the way through the layer the way they do with terrace nacre. What happens is a tower grows up and it pierces the membrane, the, the surface membrane, and then the surface membrane is triggered to separate and a new layer comes down. And what happens is the nutrients come up through the tower and then they grow by spreading sideways. Totally different than the other one. But they also have the advantage that they're cute. <laughs> Hi, we're cute. Okay, all right. So, and here's what they look like. The one on the left um, shows a super magnified stack and then if you look at the next one, you can see how regular they are into towers. And on the bottom, you see there's a dark core running up the tower. That's where your, your protein is, and your nutrients go up, and, it, and that remains the same. So that even though you have all these, I mean, it's amazing how even these layers are, considering that this is something that wasn't constructed with any kind of help. It crystallized on its own. and it's a self-making mechanism. Okay, so I had a questions in for the students. So does anyone know how long a micron or a micrometer is? You know, no one knew, but my mother was there and she knows the answer because she's a microbiologist. She has to look down in her microscope all the time. And it's a millionth of a meter. And a nanometer is? A billionth of a meter. It's hard, it's hard to believe how small that is. Okay, so there's another kind of nacre. It's kind of like a precursor or a pre -nacre. And monoplacophorins are a kind of mollusk that were thought extinct. And so you guys are going to go to sleep because it's after lunch. I shouldn't have started with nacre, but you have to do it anyway. And, uh, um, yeah, you know the thing that's interesting about these is... Um, they were thought extinct and they found them in the 50s and they put them in a class and they have recently reconsidered and they moved them into the cephalopoda class which is octopus and this is what the nacre looks like foliated nacre doesn't have a, uh, an inner lamellar membrane so it it just grows freely it's like looks like butter lettuce or something but it's beautiful in its own way. I mean, we can't see this without the help of that electron microscope. But I think that some of these things, like the patterns in nacre, like spirals, are fascinating. And they apply to other things. But now Steve Metzler, who's fascinated with the Nautilus pearls, he had a pearl that was attached to the shell. So what happened was the body made a pearl. It was loose, and it got caught on the lip. and bonded to the shell and so the area where it bonded to the shell is columnar or gastropod nacre and and in a gas in one of these near the aperture it's it's gastropod nacre and inside as you go inside it's terrace nacre so there is no uh, foliated nacre present in the shell but this pearl was made of foliated nacre and what research scientists postulate is that if you seeded uh, some tissue into the body, they think that the body will pr produce foliated nacre. So now you know something that only like one millionth of a percent of the people in, in the world know. <laughs> You'll be good at quizzes. <laughs> okay, so I always, the other thing I always talk about when I give talks is about ocean acidification. Um, it's the evil twin of global warming because of carbon dioxide. And the oceans save our lives by absorbing all this extra carbon dioxide so that we can breathe better air. But what happens is it bonds 
and becomes carbonic acid. And when in the process, it uses up a free carbonate that sea life uses to form their shells. And there's so little of it now that there are areas in the world where shells, well, uh, coral reefs are, are becoming much thinner. And even like lobsters, their shells, their shells in some places are 30% thinner than they used to be. So it's a, it's a concern. And I always tell people, go to Oceana.org. You might join if you really think it's great. So here's our next question, because we're going to talk about natural pearls next. I know some of you, they, they, some of, yeah, there actually were some people who knew what this was. Which famous American woman owned these natural pearls sold at auction for 4.8 million to 82 million dollars? Liz Taylor? No. No, not Liz no, Taylor. The Duchess of Windsor. The Duchess of Windsor, and it's a trick question. Kelly Liz Klein, who had, yeah. Calvin Klein had bought it from the sale from Duchess of Windsor. So actually, there were two. <laughs> okay, so these are going to look more familiar. Um, okay, this um, pin, also Stephen Metzler's, has pee, pee pearls, and I know that because you've been on Pearl Guide, most of you have seen pee, pee pearls, but they're not a well-known thing, so I always like to talk about them in my talks. Um, you can see that this picture of my hand, how they were just rolling around in the surf, how tiny they can be. It's amazing to get any big pearls from them, but they make beautiful colors. Sarah has a fabulous strand. I think she still has it. Um, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Uh, okay. All right, this is a whole abalone pearl set in sapphires. And that's from the Rankin Pacific Coast Pearls. And I like to talk, especially with students, they're thinking about creating jewelry. These pearls can be very expensive. And you can get these parcels of really small ones for a fairly reasonable price. And so what can you do with these? And then with horn pearls, what can you do with horn pearls, which are kind of a strange shape. Jer this is Jeremy's horn pearl. And there you can see these earrings with the horn pearls are from Kojima. Thank you, Sarah. Long gone. I don't know who owns these. The middle one is from Jeremy Norris. And the one on the left from Moana in New Zealand. And uh, examples of how you can use small pearls. I especially like that ring on the left. Okay, this is a natural South Sea pearl ring. I think it's 21 millimeters. And it has a slightly brownish cast, but it's an extremely valuable pearl. But what happened a few years ago, they found that they were nucleating these pearls with pen pearls, which are mostly proteinaceous and not very valuable. You could, you could probably easily get a bucket of these if you went to the right place in the world. But they're, they're so proteinaceous, they tend to crack, and they're hard to put in jewelry. But now that the labs know that they did this, they can detect it. But when they first came up, they had auctions of perfect natural South. It was creepy. I mean, where were all of a sudden these perfect South Sea Pearl necklaces coming from? And we found out that's why. These are also from Jeremy Norris, or mixed natural pearls. And a Pteria sterner ring, a blue muscle pearl. See, I told you I was going to go faster first. OK, and then this is the thing. I'm always joking that tell people that this is our local joke on Pearl Guide, the weekly post of I found a pearl in what I was eating and a, a quahog pearl. What is it worth? And what is it worth? And the reason why everybody thinks they're so valuable is this pin on the right. Um, a beautiful example of quahog pearls and, and a beautiful piece of antique jewelry with enamel. But they were saying it was worth like $250,000. And they were you know, shopping it around and showing it. And, and it got a lot of press. And that's why everybody thinks they're worth so much. So I like to talk about cock pearls because they're one of my favorites. But um, Jeremy Norris thinks people like them because they look like jelly beans and people like candy. <laughs> and this is another one from Sarah. Oh, absolutely fabulous example of the colors, but they also come in brown, so I put a little one there from Carrie Pearls. And you can find these pearls in antique jewelry. This one is obviously from Lang Antiques, and you can go and drool over theirs anytime you want. This was owned by another man, and I'd seen it for sale elsewhere a few years ago. So it, it, if I know a lot of you follow 
jewelry even if you don't buy it and you get to know pieces of jewelry because they're so distinctive and that's kind of a fun hobby this is another one from Jeremy Norris it's from his company Monili Fine Jewels another this is part a close-up of a bracelet and a red conch pearl ring Ooh. and uh, how is this coming out okay now I've got a lot of these pictures we're gonna go through them this is from Evan Kaplan, and I'm sorry you can't see this because it's very light and pathetic looking, and it looks fabulous on this screen. But that is, it was nice. These are all huge. It had a little faint flame pattern. This one has a little more flame. You can see the, and, but you can see the surface is waxy. This is not as good a pearl because it doesn't have the porcelanous, porcelanous, you know, smooth, glassy surface. But here's one that had the color and the transparency. And then these are from Federico Barlocker, and he has a lot of them, and you may have recognized some of these. But this one had a conch flame pattern on it. I thought it was very interesting. These are all big pearls. These are smaller. These are about 38 to 40 carats. It's a match pair, which is rare. This is like the front, and they look very different on the other side, back side. But they're very valuable. They go for $2,500 to $4,000 a carat retail. And this is like totally saturated. That is a very valuable pearl, even though it isn't round. And this is the neatest one I've ever seen. It's got the transparency and the ring of fire, of flame. And he said he sat was sad because it wasn't round, but I think that makes no difference with this pearl. But you're seeing your Mella Mella pearls, and here's a picture of Mellas in jewelry. Okay, and then this one, the Cassis Cornuta, they were popular there for a while, and what happened was as soon as people figured out in Indonesia that people wanted to buy these, they started pulling up these great horn helmet shells and killing them all over the place. So um, I, you have mixed emotions about some of these things. You get excited to see the pearls, and then the next thing that happens is that the environment gets, you know, raped, basically. And here's, this is Stevens. I don't remember how large this pearl is. It's not, not, I don't think it's a huge one. But I've never seen a finer example of flame on that particular type. And then Tridacna gigas and Tridacna squamosa are clam pearls, and they usually only look good in smaller sizes. That's the Pearl of Allah on the left, and we had an article on Pearl Guide very good about it but most people don't find those attractive. And you can see that if you shine a bright light or it's in the sunlight, you get this ring of fire, so that's not a bad pearl. But the next one, this is one that Steve, Stephen had. It's, it was tr fairly translucent, and the flame is entirely, entirely around the whole pearl. I mean, if you look from the side, there's iridescent flame over the whole pearl, and when you roll it around, it just it was just like an eye following you. It's fabulous. I wish I'd had a video of it, but I couldn't focus close enough to get one. And behind that, that's what um, Tridacna squamosa are very beautiful. They come in different color uh, flesh, and there's an example. And then coming up, switching to rare culture pearls, this was great because I had a room full of students. So it's like about 50-50 whether they liked men wearing pearls or not. And mostly it was the women like the men wearing pearls and the, guy, and the guys did not like the wearing the pearls, but I'm working on them. <laughs> okay, so in rare culture pearls, I like to feature Fiji pearls from Justin Hunter because the coloration is so unusual. And, um, and, like, I, and yeah, I talked about Kamoka pearls. Actually, I went into a big thing when I was in the Oceana thing, talking about the four different companies that were recognized as ethical producers and, and about the fish. And the students love the part about the fish nibbling. Now, all, this one is still in commercial development. They had come up with the cultured conch pearls in Florida, and Dr. Megan Davis still is the person in charge, but Hector had to go back to La Paz. And uh, they would soak these animals in so something sodium chloride, and it would relax the shell so that it would extend its foot. It would just like slide out and go take me. And so they could reach inside and, and do the operations on them. And the thing that's fabulous this about this is they never hurt them. They all lived. They went in and took the pearls back out and closed it up, and they let them recuperate, and then they returned them to the wild. So they're 100 percent 
living creatures when the process is done. So for some people, that's meaningful, but they're not, I, no one has heard of them for sale yet, but I'm certain they will be soon. So this is the real North American Pearl Farm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said I enjoyed talking about it and I got these are you know I took had taken some stuff from Douglas's slide with his permission but basically you can see the students the pre days okay so there's the farm we had a good time this guy was just a hoot after I started talking to me he pulled back his cap and he had the name of his soccer team underneath and he was so proud of it it's such a cool guy this is an example of the color ranges. Now, the ones on the right are special colors. And looking at the bottom, I mean, my favorite color is the blue ones with, with the little pink on them, like the bottom. But you can see how thick the nacre is. I think you should give them a little less time and turn them over faster and make more money. <laughs> because we want you to expand and be more successful but you know that amount of wake or nacre is superfluous but beautiful all right and so here's an example the darker pearls you know they don't all fluoresce the darker pearls fluoresce white ones you know may may or may not give you a strong fluorescence but i always tell people go and visit the pearl farm eat food till you can explode i've never had such bad, bad good food in my life all right he said I was like addicted to the taco stand. They were like going breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, it's a beautiful place. Right? It is. It is. You're, you live in paradise. Hot paradise. But paradise. Okay, so we're switching to Lennis Trans. And, and, you know, I don't think you guys are going to know, but it's a rock. So I'm asking gemologists, and it's not on the A or B list stones, and, and nobody got it. But, you know, if there are rock hounds in the room, um, this stone is called bronzite. And I just think it was really beautiful. It was so different, putting Golden South Sea with rocks. OK, so the oldest, latest trend from 2010 are the souffle pearls. And Jack Lynch gave me the story. It broke the story. But Jack told me afterward that he exaggerated about the stinkiness because he wanted to get more attention. Oh, that rascal. OK, so <laughs> he said he did. He, he, he kind of misled us. Um, but I have to tell you that Jeremy and I, we were so fascinated by the color and the metallic that we lost the point of the implant. The point of the dried mud, pond scum, or whatever was to expand and get a bigger pearl. But until we saw these blue pearls, we didn't get the idea. But at the very same Tucson, at another tent show, here were these dyed pearls, and Judy McCormick, a member, took this picture. Um, can you imagine if somebody had the nerve to try and sell these? So this is why I worry about the blue pill, it, because the blue pill, you can. Some people are putting them in as little as six months, you know, six months to a year to start. So they get it in there and take it right out and put a, a, a some kind of bead in there. But this is what would happen. I mean, if you had a six month and you, you know you hit it you would it would go right through and the original souffle pearls now we there was an article in jck and they said american experts originally thought they were done but she thinks they're blue that they're nucleated with these blue pills and they were not and the chinese wouldn't spend the money on the blue pearls when their stuff they're so resourceful they use whatever is at hand they experiment wildly they're just great but um this is <laughs> no it's, so you've probably seen these because I think I got both of these off Pearl Guide. But see how beautifully thick the nacre is on that pearl? Look at the layers. Really great. All right, so there they are, and I'm not going to go big into it. But uh, Emiko Pearls had them in Tucson, and the thing, I wish I'd taken more pictures because most of them had these little, little uh, wrinkles and divots. If you look on the bottom left pearl, kind of hard to see on this it's so dark they look like raisinets you know when they cover with the chocolate and um, and that was my thought you know I would have just named them raisinets but you see that look at the dimple there and there's more dimples on it and I think that's kind of cute but these ones do not have a bunch of dimples but the advantage is with these baroque nuclei is they don't rotate so they can't get rings and they don't have quite the color banding and you're getting these beautiful young oyster luster and color. 
Okay, so this is another uh, Sarah picture. Thank you, Sarah, because I've used you endlessly over the years. But these are what the original Kasumi pearls look like. And these are what the original Chinese attempts look like. You know, they kind of look weasened, you know, strange looking. And then these are the most recent, these are Kevin Canning's pictures of the ripple pearls and what, you know, how, when you think about how far they came in just like three years, boggles the mind. More. And it, the thing, at the show, Jack Lynch was like, he thought this was a huge story, that these are freshwater pearls that have been nucleated with those same Baroque tumbled nuclei. And he thought that was a big story. And I said, well, it would have been. But the blue pearl thing just blew that out of the water because they don't have to do anything special. They'll graft a mussel three to five times and it'll be like this big when they get to the end and there's already an enormous pocket which you can put a big Baroque bead into. Um, but they are cool. And this is another Kevin one with that amazing pearl. This is from Betty Sue King. Now these are not round, but they're Edison's. And you can see she's got them draped over her hand. And these are the colors that people are really responding to. Here's some more from Kevin. All right, I threw this in because I really love to show people the difference between the natural white and the pink tequoias. Now, once they're on your skin, you're not going to see the difference. But it's, it, it's a fair, it can be a fairly strong difference. Those are both Hanadama. And these are the you know equivalent to Hanadama. They would be, and see, so you guys know all this stuff, Madama for the blue and Kinsyoku for the yellow. But the very factor that makes the pearls blue also tends to make them want to be Baroque. And so the, a Madama strand that's actually named that by the Japan Science Laboratory is very valuable. OK, so. Two are Hamadamas and one is a solid nacre freshwater. Which one? You know, shut up. <laughs> he was there. Any idea? Did you have that one up on No. It's a, oh, you know what I have? It's in the Pearl Guide News. If you guys had read the Pearl Guys News, you would know the answer. It's the outside strand. Okay, and here we're going to run through a bunch of Kevin pictures. I think these are just amazing metallic pearls. And you can see when he's holding up the light, they're white. The ambient light where you're not under the spot is very yellow. But look how metallic that is. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. And then I was fascinated by these. Mm -hmm. Now I'm hoping you've all seen these before. Mm -hmm. But they were peachy gold. And the purple is entirely overtone. It has not to do with the color, body color. More special colors. And then this is Jack, what Jack Lynch calls his dragon pearls, but very metallic fireballs. And the red box shows the area where they're seeding these because it's more colorful and more metallic. So when they first nucleate, usually it's just a tissue. Then they come back and put a coin. I mean, it varies what they do. They might put a round bead. And, and some of them get stuck to the shell, and it's like you can see the history of it. And eventually, they e may either let it collapse or put uh, uh, mud in for a souffle. What kind of pearls are these? <laughs> yeah, they're Hanadamas. They're Akoyas. I was looking for Akoyas, but that's my Hanadama strand. <laughs> Meet my, Sorry, meet my friend, okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about, these are all uh, mostly pictures that I took for Pearl Guide News. This is a pink Burmese South Sea Pearl triple strand necklace. They're now predominantly cream and white, but they used to be pink, and they're pretty. So this is the first Pearl, Pearls of the Week. It's from Ali Shan. This is from Rima Keswani at their, their gold South Sea Pearls and um, Quartz. And she loves Keshi. These are South Gold South Sea and Tahitian Keshi, and she had them all ready to go in little in little grape clusters. You can make pendants or earrings out of them. And this is Etienne Pere, who makes ceram. Now he's into ceramic, and I think it looks very good with pearls. And there, they were. I don't know. Do you like them? Yeah. See, this is good. I get people instant feedback. You know, if I asked the students, they would just like, wait a minute. You want me to think? 
these pearls were, I had, a ta had her take them off, but in order to keep them from falling over, we had to put this, it, they snap at the bottom back. So I put a picture of this woman wearing them, but they were really, really neat. Um, they're from Atelier Marissa. And then she also had this like sword in the stone pendant, and it's like an enormous South Sea pearl. Switching, we're going fast now, switching to Atore. Also Atore. Look at the quality of those South Sea pearls. This is more typical of their style. And these are the ones that made me go nuts in Tucson, but they wouldn't let me take a picture then. I took this in Las Vegas. And I saw them in the case, and I like, <laughs> and I told them, you know, what I wanted, that I wanted to take these pictures for Pearl Guide News, and, and I was looking for special pearls, and he goes, oh, wait a minute, because that was the only thing with pearls in the case. And he goes back, and he gets these jewelry rolls, and he unrolls them and pulls out this stuff, and they're sea life stuff with pearls. Mm -hmm. And then this, this one made me think of Sherry. <laughs> It's rose gold, and it's enormous, obviously. Who made those? Isabelle Langlois. Thank you for asking. She's French. And obviously, this is Galatea. And this is, these are pictures with my cell phone. Now, I had this in there before from George Venturis for Pearling Technologies. He had some people that were putting the thickest, most beautiful opals and growing them as Mabe pearls. But they were really kind of a dud, didn't take off. But here now, he grew opals in a pearl. And this one is his personal pearl. He had it in his pocket and he kept taking it out and holding it. I don't remember how big it was. Do you remember how big it was? Anyway, he said, not for sale, his personal thing. So um, now, Julmer, I got confused after I saw this later. I thought those gold ones were balls of metal. <laughs> they're so gold, and they're just beautiful. So we're just going to whip through these. Oh, except this one. This is a special strand that took 30 years to put together. I think the largest pearl is 18, but they're perfect, perfectly matched, beautiful color. And, and this company is called Utopia. I fell in love with their stuff. And this necklace, it was like, I mean, it makes me think of Dynasty. There was a woman who, it was in a display case, and she just kept coming back. She'd disappear, and she'd come back a few minutes later, and she'd just be like this in front of the thing. And I, I thought, she's not wanting to buy it for her store. Yeah, but they had a great use of gemstones. So these are South Sea pearls, great Tahitian pearls with tourmalines, and a close-up. There's a moonstone in the back there. Beautiful. At least I think they're beautiful. This one is made of bone. It's a Katie Brunini. Pretty. These were all at Tucson? This, now, these were in the Couture Show now. Oh, okay. I'm kind of jumping around. This is in the Couture Show. Who can name the designer? I was thinking you could. Paula Cravoche. Oh, Paula. One of my absolute favorites. I should have known that. Sorry. <laughs> Paula Crevoche, if you haven't ever seen, you should search online to look for her jewelry. It's all over the top and beautiful colors. And this one, I, you know, I took it because I just had to take it because it was so beautiful. And then I look closer and at the back it has Tahitian pearls, so it really is a pearl picture. But this one is Alessio Bashi. I wish you, we had a bigger screen for that. <laughs> okay, this is Ron Greenidge, Emiko Pearls International. So I always have loved these. They have the little animals, but in this case, I backed off to show how large these are. This one's like three and a half inches. This one is four and a half inches. You know, it's museum stuff. Very pretty, and they all have, they all have the finest diamonds in them. And these things aren't small. I mean, I, it's very hard for you to tell. Look how big that pearl Whoa. is. Whoa. That is a South Sea pearl. That, I don't know how they got that, but that's amazing. And uh, this little scorpion. These are from Terra and Sons conch pearls. And this bracelet, I just thought it was to die for. But that's a, that's a really rare and expensive thing. I have no idea what they sell those for. Okay, so we're going to do a couple of odd stuff, but what mollusk is cultivated to produce Sea of Cortez pearls? Pteria Yes, Pteria otherwise known as the rainbow, rainbow lip. And those are Pteria birds from Douglas. 
Okay, so uh, like I think it was about three years ago, he, Jeremy had a guy come into the office and, and show him this stuff. These pearls have been coated with something to make them glow in the dark. But um, you know, That's you see, how it happened. was it? <laughs> Michael Hongmei, Hong Kong. It was in Hong Kong. Hong Kong gave it to me. He wanted us to uh, try and promote it. And I see glowing pearls from China. <laughs> well, I have to say, but he would do almost anything. I mean, these are just so flighty. He tries people. everything. Yeah. yeah, I mean, seriously. But that's how they discover he says some it of these things. Not he says it comes out of the shell like that. I I'm okay. I have. I have issues with that. I mean, maybe they didn't wash the coating off of it because this the. It was fun. The mucus or whatever. But would you want to wear a pearl that had no? Okay. Okay. Moving on. You know this this thing with the cotton pearls and Sarah knows about this and and I know he saw the song too. We were laughing about the literature. I can't remember what it said, but it was so cute. But if you search for cotton pearls online, they'll show up on Etsy and stuff. There. They're making a comeback. They're completely imitation. They're totally imitation. They do not look real. They're huge, and they weigh next to nothing. So, like when they have those pieces where they have the giant balls on the necklaces, I'm sure some of those were cotton pearls. Okay. So until next time, I'm keeping my eye on you. <laughs> this is an ocular pearl from my Ted friend Ted Irwin, and sometimes they just form like that. Thank you for being so patient and sitting through after lunch. <laughs>